Hello, everyone. Hello. Welcome. Welcome. Many people will be joining us. But in the meantime, we yeah. solved Everything. all the world's problems. We uh, we actually thought we were alive, everyone. That's we right. And we had a great conversation, away. which was good. It was a good warm up. <laughs> and now we can do it for real. Uh, all joking aside, sincere apologies to people who have been waiting online. Yeah. Looks like we had a technical issue and both believed we were live when we were not. So yeah. now we can get started. And sincere apologies, apologies. that we are starting late. Um, we were just talking away, thinking we were live. Technology is right? not perfect, apparently. It's not perfect, but it is working now. Wonderful. Okay, so let's get yeah. started. Thank you for inviting me tonight. Thank you so much for coming. You know, it's incredible to have you here. It's such an honor to have you. It's it's really um, amazing. We have known each other on social media for a, for a few now, years yeah. now, but we just met tonight for the first time in mm -hmm. person, which is great. So, and I've already discovered that apparently neither of us know how Facebook Live And works. none of us know how to work Facebook Live. Uh, <laughs> so I wanted to talk a little bit about why we're here tonight. You know, we're here tonight going from this moment of incredible uh, Jewish celebration and joy around the holidays into this really hard moment uh, of mourning the first anniversary of the Tree of Life shooting in Pittsburgh. Yes. Um, and at Zionist, we really believe that, you know, a central Jewish value is taking action and standing in solidarity and standing in solidarity with other communities. And so we wanted to honor this anniversary by taking some time uh, to learn about what's happening with the white nationalist movement, about the threats it poses, uh, not just to our community, but to other communities that we care about and we fight for, the threats it poses to racial justice in America, um, and, and spend some time doing some learning and some thinking about white nationalism, racism, and anti-Semitism. Uh, as you may or may not know, the shooter at the Tree of Life was an avowed white nationalist, espoused white nationalist rhetoric, believed that he was fighting a white genocide, uh, and really closely linked uh, Jewish partnerships with refugee rights groups to, you know, why he felt the need to attack the Tree of Life Synagogue. So we believe that one small way we can honor the lives lost is to, the lives lost and, and the community that was really wounded. Uh, and it is to take some time to do a little learning and, and understanding how we can stand in solidarity together and to fight this threat. And I have an expert on white nationalism, racism and anti-Semitism and their intersections with me. Eric, it's incredible to have you here. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here, and um, thank you for inviting me. I'm glad to be in conversation with everyone watching in um, Facebook world, and um, send your comments. And you know, Carly, I mean, we've now known each other, as I said, yeah. like a few years, and um, it's great to be talking face to face. We have had debates, we've had conversations, mm -hmm. um, we have organized on online together. And um, I've learned a lot, and I know tonight we're all going to um, have a lot of, of, of learnings that happen. You know, we're going to talk about a heavy topic tonight, and um, white nationalism is a heavy topic. And the level of violence that occurred leading up to Tree of Life and since Tree of Life, Gilroy, um, El Paso, Texas, um, Poway, and and others, I think, really underscore that. Um, that's a lot of heaviness, and I want the audience to know two things um, that I think are probably the most important things to know, but we don't want you tuning out after I say that. They may be important, but right? you should still, you know, stick around. Stick around. The, the first is, is that even with the level of white nationalist violence and organizing that's happening, we should always keep in mind that it's a reaction mm -hmm. to our successes Absolutely. at building community and strengthening democracy um, in America. And we should really hold that and, and understand that. Um, it is a reaction to the momentum of humans wanting to be humans with one another, yeah. right? Um, and some people are fearful of that um, and oppose that. That, you know, and in that, it's important to remember this is not a left or right. This is not a 
liberal or conservative. Uh, this is really about inclusion versus exclusion. And uh, there are more of us committed to inclusion uh, than exclusion. The second is simply this, that the answer, right? I'm gonna give people the answer right away about how do we solve the threat of white nationalism? Um, and the answer is simply this. Um, the way that we deal with attacks on community and democracy is by responding with more democracy yes. and more community. And that's why I'm glad to be here with you tonight. I'm so glad you're here. And I totally agree. You know, one of the things I talk a lot about with our grassroots, with all of you, is most Americans are so much more powerful than they know. There's power there that you can seize, power there that, you know, we can organize and have to, to make real change. Um, and, you know, you respond to a threat and white nationalism and anti-Semitism and racism are, are huge threats for our democracy. Um, and you respond to a threat to democracy by doubling down on democracy. I love that. Yeah. Uh, so my first question for you, you know, for those in the audience for whom this is a little newer, when we talk about white supremacy, white nationalism, racial justice, can you help us sort of define those terms a little bit, you know, yeah. and talk a little bit more about what is the white nationalist threat and how is that a distinct threat to our community? And why is it a threat? Yeah. So it's, it's interesting. We use a lot of words, right? White supremacy, racist movements, hate groups, white nationalism, you know, what do they all mean? And I'm going to talk a little bit about that right now because White supremacy and, and white nationalism do mean specific things that we should understand. Um, I'm going to start first by talking about white supremacy. Mm -hmm. White supremacy is a system. It is a historic and present day system. It was set up hundreds of years ago. So I want everyone to take a deep breath for a second and, and realize none of us are responsible for that system. We weren't here hundreds of years ago uh, to, to design it. Um, we are responsible for the system today and how it per perpetuates uh -huh. itself. But, you know, but white supremacy is a system that was designed as a form of organizing society. And it was based off the idea that people were superior or inferior based off of their skin color. And imagine that this is how society was run. No one questioned it. It was like breathing air um, if you were white. Yeah. White supremacy, you know, we think of it as Jim Crow, separate but equal. But at its core, white supremacy had three core components. The first was the genocide and stolen resources of Native people. The second was the subjugation and exploited labor of Black people. Mm -hmm. And the third, Carly, not often talked about but should be, right? It was the control of sexuality and women's reproductive rights. Mm -hmm. These were the three core pillars of, of white supremacy. And I'll point out that, you know, white nationalism is a huge threat to all American women. Yes. If you're watching and you're not Jewish or you're not a person of color and, and you're a woman and you're thinking, well, what does this have to do with me? It is a significant threat. Misogyny is a major uh, unifying factor. That's right. Yeah. And what we know is the majority of victims of white nationalist violence have been women. Mm -hmm. And um, that is not by coincidence. That is the strain of misogyny um, that underlies white nationalism. But let's think about white supremacy. So white supremacy is challenged in the 1960s by the civil rights movement, right? And um, this is Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, um, and, and thousands of others, right? And they successfully defeat separate but equal, mm -hmm. right? The idea of segregation, meaning white supremacy is no longer the rule of law. Right. It still exists, but it's now a contested space. That's a huge victory in this country. But imagine you believe in Jim Crow. You believe you are superior just because you have white skin. You are never going to allow or accept that you lost to black people politically. Yeah. It would destroy your whole understanding of your whole how, world view. Your whole world yeah. view. So another answer had to be created. And these segregationists and a white supremacist drew from anti-Semitic literature of Europe, 
particularly the protocols of the elders of Zion. And within the protocols, they created a new form of anti-Semitism in the U.S. Because let's be clear, anti-Semitism existed in the U.S. and has. But in the 1960s, after the defeat of the civil rights movement, it takes on a new form. Mm -hmm. And it is the idea of Jews controlling or attempting to control the United States. And not only that, but Jews are framed not only as simply another race, but something entirely different. So these segregationists then place Jews as responsible for the victory of the civil rights movement, allowing them to maintain their idea of black people as inferior. It becomes the answer to every other civil rights game, whether we're talking about women's rights, whether we're talking about workers, whether we're talking about immigrants, or the LGBT community, Jews always become centered as the cause and that it being a dangerous thing. What I tell people is that the white nationalist movement forms as a reaction to the civil rights movement and it no longer seeks to go back to the days of subjugation. Instead, it carves out a new worldview that says that they want a white-only ethnostate that is free of people of color and Jews. The difference between white supremacy and white nationalism is this. White supremacy is a system of exploitation. White nationalism is an ideology mm -hmm. of ethnic cleansing. With, of course, then with that ideology, a strong tie to domestic terrorism. With a strong tie, because the only way you get to an ethnostate in America, one of the most diverse societies, is through ethnic cleansing. Yeah. And it, we should understand that the worldview of anti-Semitism drives white nationalism in the United it's States. It's so fascinating. As you look at the anti-Semitism conspiracy theory as it functions within the white nationalist movement, it does feel so close to the protocols of the elders of Zion right. to any other sort of major rise of anti-Semitism in history globally, in That's the right. sense that it is organized around social and political upheaval right. uh, and who to blame it for. Now, in this case, they're blaming it for a positive, but still, uh, you know, who do we sort of blame for these changes that we're unhappy with? Jews. That's right. A marginalized community. Mm -hmm. Um, and it is, it borrows heavily from the European model, wow. right? As we know, there has um, always been forms of anti-Jewish bigotry, right, in the world, predates the protocols, predates even anti-Semitism as a specific strand of anti-Jewish hatred. And what we know is that anti-Semitism as a form of anti-Jewish hatred is an ideology. Yeah. And it is an ideology that both threatens Jews and threatens the idea of democracy, people-centered government that is transparent and accountable. Yeah. Anti-Semitism sees democracy as a threat, just as it sees Jews as a threat. Wow. So I'm really fascinated by your research. You know, it, it takes a lot of chutzpah, for lack of a better term, <laughs> to, to do first-person research, you know, with that white nationalist groups and to do it as a black man. Uh, I've always just wanted to ask you, can you tell us a little bit more about that, about what that was like? Yeah, so not as exciting as it sounds, uh -huh. right? Um, I think um, it, it gets romanticized um, uh, a lot, and there are folks who have done much deeper research, mm -hmm. but it is true that um, I spent a lot of time in the 90s um, and early 2000s with different segments um, of what we now know as the white nationalist movement and militia movement um, and others in the United States. And um, I spent a lot of time talking to um, both individuals who were part of those movements and spending time with some of their leaders. Yeah. And, um, Sometimes you have to believe what people tell you about themselves and, and about their movements. And, um, you know, my first meeting was uh, to a political convention 
uh, whose party had run David Duke as president, uh, as their presidential candidate, the cycle before. And in that, in that meeting um, of a couple of hundred individuals, including various segments of the white nationalist yeah. movement, from neo-Nazis on to survivalists and, and others, what, what I could say is that the lesson is this, that um, folks were very clear, right? So I'll, I'll tell a story that I tell in Skin in the Game, the essay. Mm. I was at a Which meeting. Which you should read if you haven't. It's <laughs> so great. <laughs> thank you. Very, yeah. Thank you very much. It was amazing doing uh, that work and pulling together that essay. Um, so I walk into a meeting. Uh, an individual walks up to me right away, sticks out his hand, uh, and you know I'm one of the few black folks in in there, yeah. probably one of three. So you're not expecting immediate. Entrance. I'm not expecting not immediate nice. warm welcome. He is excited to see me, and I tell more about that uh, interaction. But basically, he says, "I want to invite you to come hear this other speaker yeah. who's speaking, and I want you to hear him because he was talking today about the need of building a broad movement, right? Mm -hmm. And in his own words, what he said is." You know, he talked about bringing together blacks, and then he said Orientals and Mexicans, right, together with white folks because we have to fight the real enemy, right? And I don't have to tell probably 90% of the folks watching mm -hmm. us right now who he enemy. meant by the real enemy. And what that underscored was an experience that I saw uh, throughout that research with the white nationalist movement mm -hmm. is they were deeply racist deeply homophobic, deeply Islamophobic, you name it, they were. But at the core of all of those forms of bigotry was always anti-Semitism, right? So in its yeah. imagery and in its rhetoric. And it almost seems theological, for lack of a better term. It is, it is almost theological. I mean, there were definitely yeah. elements within the white nationalist movement who taught that Jews were the literal children of Satan, people of color were subhuman and or chattel, and that white Northern Europeans were the lost descendants of, of the tribes of Europe. It was deeply anti-Semitic as a belief system. And it is how I became to understand that anti-Semitism wasn't just a behavior, it was an ideology. And in the United States, mm -hmm. the most organized ideology around anti-Semitism was white nationalism. And we so often think of these fights as separate, but the white nationalist movement makes it very clear that they're actually, you know, to our most violent and most dangerous foes, these fights are completely unified. That's, it is one fight um, in terms of the white nationalist movement. And, you know, what many of us don't understand is at the center of that fight, white nationalist theorists believe that they are in existential fight uh, with what they call the Jew or the Jewish question. And it is uh, terrifying. In their minds, everything else is a puppet of that Jewish enemy that they name. And so it denies the agency, right? of people of color, of LGBTQ communities. But it's so others. deeply racist in its, its anti-Semitism. It's so deeply racist and it's, an, it's even uber racist because it doesn't even place Jews as human in this worldview. Merely as an existential fight, um, I tell folks the closest kind of cultural understanding of it is to look at the plot line of the X-Files. And I'm not calling X-Files anti-Semitic, let's be clear, nor Chris Carter, et cetera. What I'm saying is, is it's the that idea level of this conspiracy ultimate theory battle. and ultimate battle That's and, right. and existential fight. That's a really interesting comparison. So, and I, I just want to be sort of really clear in this next question. Do we believe that white, not, do you believe, you know much more about the topic than I do, which is why you're here. Thank you. Uh, do you believe that the white nationalist movement is rising and mainstreaming? And is, do you think that that is what is primarily causing rising hate crimes against American Jews, which is, you know, a huge concern to the Zionist community. So I wish I could give a, a simple answer and say white nationalism is the cause of all of yeah. our, uh -huh. our problems in America. I don't, that's not accurate. What I would say is the most significant political threat in the United States 
to the Jewish community, but also to non-Jews because it is an attack on democracy, um, is the white nationalist movement. Over 80 people have been murdered, yeah. right? In the last two years alone, by members of the white nationalist movement in the United States, right? There have been countless examples of intimidation and harassment, right? We know for a fact that in the last electoral cycle, over 300 white nationalists ran for public office. That's crazy. In any other previous cycle, the most that was ever tracked was somewhere around 40. Right. So we know that it is a movement that is on unless you don't believe the Department of Justice, unless you don't believe the Department of Homeland Security, unless you don't believe the FBI. Right. Um, what we know is that leading authorities from the ADL to the federal government have said to us that white nationalism is a growing threat. Now, can I say something? Yeah, because I think this is really important. Um, Hate groups don't come to our towns bringing racism or Islamophobia or homophobia mm -hmm. or anti-Semitism with them. They organize the bigotry that already exists. Yeah. If the white nationalist mm -hmm. movement has tapped into anti-Semitism as an organizing ideology, it is it because already anti-Semitism already exists in our society and it is unchecked. I'll give you an example. When I was working in the Pacific Northwest in the 90s, there was a hate crime in a community where um, an African-American couple had moved in. And um, we were out there working with the community on how to respond. And we were talking to a community member and they said to us, you know, there was no racism in this community until this couple moved in. Right? Oh my God. right, that was their understanding. For most of America, there was no anti-Semitism in America until the white nationalist movement showed up. Mm -hmm. But we all know, right, that it is in the air we breathe. Yeah. It's really interesting. I heard D. Ray McKesson speak a couple of weeks ago and he said the same thing yes. about racism. You have to view it as, as we all live in smog and you're going to breathe it in and it's going right. to be in your brain and in your body. And the best thing you can do is just try not to breathe it back out. That's right. That that's the whole fight. That is actually a really good analogy. And it tells us then yeah. um, that one of the ways that we get to building more democracy and more community is by actually addressing the anti-Semitism that exists in our society. We yeah. deny them that fuel to the white nationalist movement. And, and that's something that is so key to what Zioness is doing and how Zioness came to be. You know, Zioness has really grown as a response to the alienation and the anti Semitism and the hurt, the community relationships have been damaged by anti Semitism, particularly on the progressive left. You know, people often so see. So often, you know, think of Zionists as attacking the left, but the truth is, it you know, it's people who want to be in coalition, are passionate about fighting racism, are passionate about gay rights, are passionate about women's rights, are passionate about anti-oppression issues and about systemic change, and felt they had nowhere to go to do it. Um, and Zionists can be a place for them to do it, uh, as Jews and you know, the vast majority of Jews worldwide, including in America, are Zionists. So so one of the things I wanted to ask you is, you know, as we do that as Jews who have really struggled with progressive organizing, that is what brought a lot of people here. You know, what advice do you have for us um, in terms of not just, you know, we care about white nationalism because it's a threat to our community, but we care about racial justice and we care about gay rights and you know, we want to do that as Jews and we want to do that as Zionists, which we overwhelmingly are. And, and, you know, how do we build coalitions within that and do effective work within that really difficult paradigm where we are facing anti-Semitism and wanting to fight it and also wanting to fight that, like we talk about these fights being holistic, but, you know, wanting to fight that as we fight, 
you know, these broader systemic hatreds. Does that make sense? It what does, I'm getting at? Yeah. It does make sense. So I think, I mean, what, what I would tell people is we have to be brave. Yeah. Right? Um, and we at call ourselves time, INS. I think we're pretty brave. See, so you're <laughs> saying you're brave. Folks out here mm -hmm. are feeling brave. Yeah. And what I mean about this, what I mean by brave is the bravest thing we can do is to take a first step towards someone who is not like us, mm -hmm. right? Um, who also feels threatened, right? That's the most courageous act. Typically what happens, right? I'm, I'm a big nerd, so you know I can talk Lord of the Rings all night, yeah. right? Um, Everyone loves the final film or the last book yeah. of, of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. And uh, it's when the big battle happens mm -hmm. and it's very exciting. And um, But most of the work takes place long before then. Yeah. And most of the buildup starts with just the first step, mm -hmm. right? It's people moving themselves out of their comfort zone, right? willingly into a space of others, right, who see the same challenge, right, and and realize that we have to be there together, right? And yeah. that's what Zionist right? wants to do is be in those spaces. Is to be in those spaces. Yeah. So the things that I would kind of say to folks is, you know, the first is really clearly getting elected officials to speak out against anti-Semitism. Even those who clearly, you you know, you can tell are opposed to white nationalism, having them say it publicly is so important right now. That's the most courageous thing we can do is to get elected officials to do that. The second is, is to hold elected officials accountable, mm -hmm. right, when they falter around anti-Semitism um, or when they... Um, align with the white nationalist movement overtly, right? And um, and the third, I think, is to realize that the differences that we hold in identities, we hold multiple identities, and I know we'll talk about this or we'll get a question about intersectionality and, and identity politics um, later on this evening, I hope, actually, maybe now I'm just plugging. Um, for a question, but I think from uh, a place of our humanity, it is critically important to realize that our differences exist yeah. so that we can recognize the humanity in others, right? And um, that can be so simple. You don't have to get up and stand in front of a white nationalist, right, and shout them down. You can take like gift certificates, Starbucks certificates, mm. and drop them off at a local women's shelter or yeah. immigrant rights center or uh, to the public school down, mm -hmm. down the street. Um, these are things that all, there's no reason that we can every do time we things. act in community we actively are pushing against white nationalism it, every time it's we amazing. recognize each other's humanity it is a blow against white nationalism those are the easy first steps mm -hmm. that i think anyone can do then there's the next level right what does it mean to be an organization right that is working for an inclusive society what are the priority issues that one might work on? Because it's not just simply about pushing back against white nationalism. It is about creating a real alternative yeah. to white nationalism. And I'll, I'll share a story here um, that happened in Portland, Oregon. It's another story I tell a lot. There was a young white nationalist or alt-right, right? right? Yeah. I, I want to peg him, who was... Um, who was uh, at a protest in Portland, and he was being interviewed by someone. And the person was asking him, why are you in Portland, Oregon, right? No one wants you. He's pointing to all these protesters around. He's like, the mayor says he doesn't want you. The community says they don't want you. Why are you here? And this alt-right white nationalist activist 
said back to the person holding the camera, yeah, I've heard that too. But the fact of the matter is, he went on to say, the city of Portland is an urban city in America that is shrinking in whole black population and by percentage. He said, basically the black population is disappearing in Portland, Oregon. And then he looked the cameraman in the eye and he said, you can say you don't want us here, but you're actually doing something we could never get away with. You are disappearing the black community of Portland, Oregon. Wow. He was basically calling us hypocrites. And that's why social justice, right? Working for the rights of women, working to diminish Islamophobia and anti-Semitism, working to strengthen the rights of the LGBTQ community, working for like strong public education. That's why those issues yeah. are just as important. You can't do it all, right? No one can do it all. Sure. But as an organization, you can find two or three things that make it part of a mosaic mm -hmm. that is trying to strengthen and preserve democracy in America. That's beautiful. So some of the pushback that we get, um, really for a lot of times for people are thought our movement is you know you're really focusing on white nationalism and, and showing up in solidarity and, and and wanting to build coalitions but you know there's a lot of violence against jews that we don't believe has anything to do with white nationalism that's one of the big yes. really hard conversations that the jewish community is having um you know, you see what's happening in Brooklyn with, you know, violence and intimidation against the Jewish community sure. on an almost daily basis happening, you know, across the spectrum. Sure. And a lot of questions about, you know, are we arguing that that comes from white nationalism? Are we arguing that it doesn't? Are we arguing that it sort of abstractly comes from it? Where does it come from? And, you know, if we're focused on coalition building and fighting the great fights, you know, one, you know, how, how do we deal with this difficult example? And, and so you know, the question then becomes, you know, how do we respond to hate crimes that aren't committed, at least by people who don't see themselves as being part of the right? You know, what is the correct response to that sort of violent anti-Semitism that is a major threat, particularly for visible Jews? So I think that's a really good question. I'm glad you brought that up. So my sense is, you know, first, I think we have to be clear, right? So I'm not saying that the attacks that are happening in Brooklyn are influenced by left politics, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm also saying that uh, at least based off of who has been arrested or accused, right? Mm -hmm. That it's clearly not driven by the white nationalist movement. Yeah. So if I could be honest, if I were living in Brooklyn, Oregon, right, or in Brooklyn, New York, looking for Brooklyn, like, there, is, there, is, Brooklyn there is actually a Brooklyn, uh, 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 but anyway. We gotta get into we'll New get York, that. guys, yeah. because Brooklyn's in I've Oregon. already forgotten now, we have a Brooklyn neighborhood in Portland, yeah. but I guess I've been away from New York too long now, uh -huh. I don't have to go back. But um, if you are Haredi, right, um, Orthodox, Hasidic in, um, in Brooklyn, New York. Your primary concern around anti uh, around anti Semitism isn't the white nationalist movement. Yeah. Right. Um, and I think those of us who are committed to social change and social justice have to be aware of that. Right. And and understand that. Now, am I saying at the end of the day that those attacks are politically oriented? Yeah. Right we don't know yet, yeah. right? Um, and I think we need to understand that. We shouldn't be so quick to dismiss. I think it is fine and right for us to say, we don't know, right? What we do know is that an environment exists in the United States um, where anti-Semitism um, is an acceptable form of behavior, making it just like every other form of bigotry yeah. in the United States. And that doesn't make it okay, right? And is it being tapped into? Absolutely that anti-Semitism gets tapped into um, politically, right? 
Is it the mission-oriented hate crimes of the white nationalist movement? It's not, it doesn't appear to be the mission-oriented hate crimes. But if we want to take on white nationalism, it means we have to also be willing to take on anti-Semitism, yeah. right? And that means within the social change world, anti-Semitism needs to be considered along with every form of bigotry. And when we deny it, we become participants in helping to seed an environment mm -hmm. that allows anti-Semitic hate crimes to occur. So what I would say is that in ways that we signal resistance yeah. to accepting the presence of anti-Semitism leads to the conditions that cause anti-Semitic hate crimes to happen. My next question is a very simple one. Can I use your phone charger? Yes, you can. Thank you. I Look, wanna, we are sharing chargers here. We're sharing, you know, community solidarity. That's right. I want to uh, be able to see any questions that come in. And as I look down, I realize my phone had died. Oh, no. See, um, okay, well, we'll give you time to, to charge up. <laughs> I mean, I would just say that I want folks in the audience to know, right, that there is a healthy debate on anti-Semitism in America mm -hmm. right now it, because there needed to be a healthy yeah. debate, right? And um, of course, we're not all going to agree around what anti-Semitism um, exactly is. Like, I'm a person, right, who refuses to accept any of the one definitions of, mm -hmm. of anti-Semitism. I want a full debate. I want those to be guides, right, because it has been a long time outside of some of the, the um, I think, respected communal organizations like the Anti-Defamation League, right, um, uh, and others, where the rest of America has actually ever had a conversation around yeah. anti-Semitism in this way. And you know what, Carly? I don't know about everyone else, but I was not born woke, not on any topic that no. one can name in, in this society. And when new information was presented to me, it took, I, I mean, I had to wrestle with it. I had yeah. to get used to, to terms. I had to get used to kind of understanding, mm -hmm. right? I, and, and, you know, I, I'd love to say that, wow, the first time someone approached me and said, LGBTQ issues, you need to understand them. I'd love to sit up here and say, I totally got it just like that. Or when someone came to me and said, Eric, you need to understand disability access yeah. issues. Um, or Eric, I think you're being Islamophobic because I just heard you now uh, make every Arab Muslim, right? Um, so I'd love to say, like, I just got those issues right away. No but I had to wrestle. No. No, one, no one did. And so part of it is creating an environment where um, – we keep the issue on the table, right? But we try to keep people at the table. Yeah. And that's the hard, that's the hard work that doesn't make it into the last moments of Lord of the Rings. No, absolutely. And I think as a movement, you know, one of the things I want to do later this year is do some training on how we talk about those things. When we all, ha you know, no one is born woke and we all have moments where we learn and change and grow. Um, you know, I'm in dialogue groups as well where people talk about things they're facing, et cetera, and how we as a movement could say to each other, you know, um, you know, that's, you know, maybe racist or that's bigoted in this way or that way. And not in a way that is disposable, but, but in a way that, you know, seeks to ultimately undermine those who really do want a fully stratified society with ethnic cleansing and, and all that comes along with that. Um, so the, when we talk about rising hate crimes, I, I know it's a big, you know, we're mourning the biggest hate crime against Jews in American history. Right. For me, I always see hate crimes, like rising hate crimes across the spectrum as innately linked. Yeah. Do you agree with that assessment? Like the rising anti-Semitism hate crimes, the when we, the, the, this is one sort of beast we're fighting. It is, it is, um, it is a beast that, that we are fighting. So, you know, I, I would break it down. So there is the mission-oriented hate crimes. Mm -hmm. And that primarily seems to be driven from one 
one part of the American politic, which is the white nationalist movement, right? It's framed as conservative, but there is nothing conservative or about the white nationalist movement um, in America. It, it is white nationalist. It is based off of ethnic cleansing. But with that said, right, I think it's important to know that the white nationalist movement also takes signals mm -hmm. around what is acceptable in society. Yeah. And they take their cues from how we respond to day-to-day -day Well, it makes sense. They are a political organizing That's movement. Right. And look, I look for moments where it makes sense to raise the alarm about anti-Semitism or right. push my own agenda. So they look for moments, whether it's dog whistle politics or other moments where they can would they see an opening to push their agenda? That That's makes right. total sense to me. Yeah. And they take advantage of it. They seek to wedge yeah. communities because, again, community, right, Inclu the idea of inclusive community that is aligned around one another is um, a threat. And they realize that there is a mm -hmm. danger around their anti-Semitism. Which is why, I mean, you see, you even saw it with, David Duke praising uh, Representative Ilhan right. Omar's comments, which she eventually apologized for. That's right. Uh, and you saw him really right. praising that because... He's an organizer. He's an organizer. <laughs> he, <laughs> any sort of discord, not that that means we shouldn't you know, call in or call out bigoted right. behavior or hold each other accountable, because we absolutely should, but they innately see community discord as a positive for them. That's right. We have to hear one another. Right. Um, that's part of our strength of being in the room together. Look, we're not all going to agree on everything. Right. Right. Um, but I liken it to this. And I, I've been saying this a lot in a lot of different situations. Right. Um, we can have as many fights as we want. Right. Um, the living room fight is the healthiest fight in the world. But we have to distinguish between the fight in the living room and the person who's trying to burn down our house, yeah. right? And That's um, interesting. the white nationalist movement is trying to burn down the house of democracy. And democracy is the best protector of rights that we have ever established in, in modern society. And it society. makes sense because anti-Semitism is, is anti-Semitism historically innately bad for democracy Terrible. And good for authoritarianism. Good for authoritarianism. You can blame someone for else for your country's problems. That's right. It, it's great for an authoritarian. A small group, marginalized, where the components of tropes and stereotypes already exist. So I want to shift a little. I have a couple yeah. of questions coming in. Um, hi. hi. There are people actually watching and listening to Hello. us. Hello. We're very happy to talk to you. Hey, everyone. Uh, as we know, the vast majority of Jews are Zionists, and you know, at Zionists, we define that as Jewish liberation, Jewish peoplehood, and Jewish self determination in our indigenous yep. homeland. Um, just to be clear about how we're using that word, and you note in your piece that there's overlap between anti Zionism and anti Semitism. Yes. How do we address anti Semitism in movements that are fighting for racial justice and fighting white nationalism and, and address tensions that arise? When many Jews feel anti-Zionism is definitionally anti-Semitic, um, you know, especially given the importance of coalition building. And then I have another similar one. Um, you know, you mentioned in your article, uh, talk about Zogs, Zionist organized governments. Can you explain, you know, uh, why that's anti-Semitic and, um, you know, and how that interacts Sort of politically across the spectrum. Yeah. So let me reverse sure. those pieces. So I think folks should understand every person has their own historical uh, uh, path that influences how they see things. Sure. So for me, um, anti Zionists coming out of, uh, remember, I organized against the white nationalist movement yeah. um, for decades. The White nationalist movement centered in its threat assessment, right, in its battle, the ultimate evil being the Jew, right? That's how the mm -hmm. Jew, that's how they talk about it. And it was 95% of the time, and I think 
I'm undercutting that, mm -hmm. right? 95% of the time defined as the Zionist occupational government. Really? Right? That and they use the term occupation. They use the Zionist oh. occupational government. And it was the belief that through the victory of the civil rights movement, through the victory of, of the women's rights movement, through the victory of labor, right, and through immigration, that Jews had taken control of the government, right, that the United States was no longer for white people, and that the war was against the Zionist occupational government, or what they called Zog, mm -hmm. as shorthand. So that's one piece. The second piece to remember in my history is that in this collection of, of, of posters and flyers that were extremely bigoted, it was rare, right, that there wasn't the Star of David on there has a trope or a stereotype mm -hmm. to reinforce their bigotry, yeah. right? So, and then the third is that most white nationalists, right, had fantasies, right, of Israel being bombed through atomic weapons, right, William Pierce, and his um and you hear this rhetoric it's really interesting you bring that up because you hear rhetoric on the far left like well white nationalists support israel they don't really no, they, they support no. the idea of you going there so you can then be that's right yeah i mean if it's even even if we could call it philo-semitism which is a form of anti-semitism let's be clear right william pierce ends the turner diaries right not around the revolutionary white nationalist ethnic cleansing that happens in the US, but with an epilogue around a plane dropping an atomic bomb on Israel. So it's not about Jewish liberation and Zionism. It, it is absolutely not. It's about it is, it is, ghettoization. It is about ghettoization. It is about the removal. Remember, there's a movement committed to ethnic cleansing. Yeah. It is about the removal of Jews from the United States, mm -hmm. right? And so it is a cynical piece. Now, are white nationalists looking elsewhere for governments that they perceive um, or think are leaning towards authoritarianism, right? Mm -hmm. Or anti-democratic policies? Absolutely, right? Yeah. Um, and what we know is that politics make for strange bedfellows, right? So that's the piece we need to understand about how I came to understand those symbolisms. Now, I think there is a challenge in being able to have a conversation around anti-Semitism, right? Um, because I am not a person who will ever say that anti-Zionism doesn't get used in ways that are anti-Semitic, mm -hmm. right? And um, if I could give a parallel, and I know now I think sure. it is a long answer to That's okay. a short question, question, but I think it's worth digging into. So let me give you a parallel. Mm -hmm. I talk to folks all the time who don't believe in black nationalism, right? But they oppose racism, mm -hmm. right? I would never say they don't oppose racism. I mean, they don't oppose racism because they don't support black nationalism, yeah. right? I, I can distinguish between the two. Now, are there some folks who oppose white nationalism because they are racist or, yeah. um, or become racist or act in racist ways? Absolutely, right? People are murky. My problem, right, with um, in this debate is that as someone who deals with racism, as a racial justice activist, mm -hmm. I often talk about the moment where I'm doing work around racial justice, particularly around anti-black racism. And a person, the first thing they say is, but I want to talk to you about black on black crime. Yeah. How am I to reflect on that right. in a moment, right? Now, if I know you, Mm -hmm. And I know, like, your background and your activism on racism. I might say to myself, that's a real legitimate question, right? There's nothing wrong with you have to trust the conversation. The yes, but having a history of work makes trusting that intention easier. Yeah. 
if if that person doesn't have that history, I think that they're deflecting, right? So I often find it a form of deflection that every time we talk about anti-Semitism, the response is, well, I want to talk to you about Zionism or I want to talk to you about Israel. Those are certainly legitimate conversations, yeah. right? I find, though, that is it a way of people avoiding talking about anti-Semitism. Because if you understand anti-Semitism, you do often see ways that um, critiques of Zionism, right, absolutely drink from the well of, of anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. I think that that is very, very clear. Um, and it's a hard discussion to discuss yeah. when there is no founding or founding understanding of anti-Semitism. Or, or founding understanding, to be frank, of Zionism. That's right. You know, uh, and I think it's a complicated thing for people, uh, including at Zionist, in social justice spaces who care about Zionism, who are showing up with signs saying, I'm a Zionist. That's right. And I, like, we're going to be at the Supreme Court in a couple weeks saying, we're Zionists and we, you know, support DACA recipients and we support DREAMers. And people, you know, um, they don't understand what Zionism means. Sure. They don't understand that it is, at, you know, the most recent polls put support at 95% in the Jewish community. And that while there is healthy debate, including among Zionist activists, I watch your Facebook pages, um, about Israeli policy, uh, about Israeli politics, Zionism for, for many American Jews, really most, it, it's a threshold that, that can't be passed. Uh, so I, I'm curious about, um, you know, as we build coalitions um, and say, like, we're Zionists and we're Jews. And at Zionists, we really believe that Zionism is pretty intrinsic to our Jewishness. Um, but, but we want to close Rikers. And we are, you know, concerned about Black maternal health. And we're concerned about rising threats to the LGBTQ community and we're passionate about refugees. How do we, you know, um, hold, hold that space? And I think that's something that people come to Zionists because they're struggling with it and because they say, I want to be in this place. But when you come to me and say, you are white colonialist if you believe in Zionism and you can't be here anymore if you believe in Zionism, it's become a really uh, something the community is really struggling with. Yeah, well, no one can stop uh, yeah. a group or individuals for organizing for social change, yeah. right? And um, and you shouldn't let anyone stop you from organizing for social change. I think you know my sense is that um, I wrote about this once in, in another. Um, actually, I didn't write about this. Um, it was an interview in Tacoon Magazine yeah. called um, Beyond Identity Politics. And um, I, I, you know, skin in the game is one look at, at anti-Semitism. And I wanted to look at anti-Semitism from another perspective and mm -hmm. from the perspective of, of identity politics and, and what it meant. Here is, here is my quick answers. And we'll move on because there, there's probably other questions. The, the first is, is that it is a fight worth having, yeah. right? Um, um, I told, tell people in this interview um, something that's really hard for those of us who are interested in building community and mm -hmm. sense of justice. That's really true. You can't fight racism without experiencing racism. You can't fight sexism without experiencing sexism. And you can't fight anti-Semitism without experiencing anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is that we can only fight those things by putting ourselves in civil society, right? Within public space, um, within dialogue and, and debate with one another. Yeah. Which means we are also going to feel other people, no, none of us are perfect, right? And so we are going to feel some of that, sometimes intentional, sometimes unintentional, mm -hmm. but it's going to feel the same, right? Yeah. It still stinks. So I think it's important to remember, though, 
that that fight and those debates are worth having. And it doesn't take away from other debates. It's okay yeah. to talk about human rights and debate human rights abuses, right? It's okay to talk about government policies. It's not okay to utilize anti-Semitism mm -hmm. in trying to argue and debate those points. And what I know is that conversations around violence in the black community with non-black folks are more productive conversations, right? When folks have a good steeping understanding of racism, right? Um, when an understanding of racism is lacking, typically those conversations produce more forms of racism. Yeah. And that's what I would say um, for folks who really see, right, um, government policies in Israel somehow tie the conversations of, of anti-Semitism in America, the onus is on them to understand anti-Semitism even better then, Yeah. right? Um, I actually think that um, anti-Semitism in America is a conversation worth having that stands on its own right now because yeah. of the potential implication um, of the damage that anti-Semitism can cause in the United States. It's really interesting. Um, so you quoted uh, Alan Dershowitz as saying intersectionality is inherently anti-Semitic. Yes. Uh, we fundamentally disagree with Alan Dershowitz. Yeah, and I pushed back on him as well. Um, and I actually struggle with how few people look at the core original article on intersectionality before they discuss it, which I would encourage all of you to do if you've never read Kimberly Crenshaw. Read um, Kimberly Crenshaw, one of the smartest people. Yes. Um, and, you know, but we do believe that there are, are times when the broad concept of intersectionality is really misapplied in ways that are really designed to exclude Jews, whether sort of purposefully anti-Semitic, which I think happens, or not purposefully anti-Semitic, um, but that ends up being really exclusive towards Jews. So how can we, you know, work in coalition spaces where Jews are treated as privileged white people who don't face oppression and don't have skin in the game of these fights? Yeah, so first the Jewish community has to, it's, or, or at least, it's a diverse community, yeah. so I don't want to speak um, overall, but then sometimes I remember how intimate that community is, yeah. such as after Tree of Life. I know many people who don't know each other, at least I don't mm -hmm. know them in common, uh, who have been touched, which tells me about also yeah. that it is an intimate community. It's a small community, and these things are felt largely within that community. I, I would say this. It's important to understand, right, that power mm -hmm. and privilege works in many different yeah. ways in a society, mm -hmm. right? Um, so on one hand, right, as a male, I carry certain privileges in the society mm -hmm. um, that are privileges that even white women don't have, right? Um, so one of the reasons men get promoted, right? Uh, this, or one of the, I should say, one of the excuses yeah. used to give, uh, 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 to explain male promotion in the workplace is that men work really hard yeah. and they work really long hours. And this person was, well, working late in an office is a form of male privilege, right? Mm -hmm. To leave at, you know, when I worked at the Ford Foundation, I would leave sometimes at 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. That was a form of male privilege, yeah. right? And one of the ways, you know, folks could respond is look at Eric, right? He's really just burning yeah. the midnight oil. Okay, so we know privileges work in different ways. Mm -hmm. It's important to carry that context, right? But this is not a, a um, we're not creating a hierarchy here. We are trying to understand how different forms of bigotry function in a society. And I think that folks have lost that, um, that understanding, right?
And I think that um, we have to do a better job of revisiting the roots of identity politics yeah. um, and intersectionality. We don't have to wonder. All the amazing Black and Latina and Asian LGBTQ women who did that phenomenal work, most of them are still with us, yeah. right? And we should be asking them, right? What was their understanding mm -hmm. at the time? What were they battling? Here is how I understand it. The, and I think this is worth knowing. Identity politics form because Black and Latino communities have been decimated when we enter into like the mid 70s and the late 70s, right? So we forget that part of the victory of the civil rights movement was also a backlash to the civil rights movement. Some of us are familiar with the documented stories of FBI harassment, even of Martin Luther King. Yeah. We forget sometimes that um, because we adore Martin Luther King now, and he's held to such esteem. The most That's, hated man in America. He was the that most was hated the, man yeah. in America. At no point in his lifetime did he have the support of a majority of Americans. Tavis right? Smiley wrote that whole book about the last year of his life and how he was so miserable. No one was sort of anointing him as... That's right. Yeah. Ha, uh, there's, there's a line someone uh, who was close to him said, uh, uh, gave a line that said... Um, any given day, two thirds of the folks who knew Martin Luther King were pissed at him. Yeah. Right? So imagine, and it could be any different two thirds combination, yeah, but yeah, yeah. on any given day. So he is under immense pressure, right? And it symbolizes the pressure that the black community is in, in the North, right? The, the uh, police abuse that's, that's being experienced, the Lack of the um, lack of opportunity in terms of jobs, right? The, the black community is in in a shambles. The crackdown on on black nationalism. So when you come out of the the seventies and in the early eighties, black leadership is decimated. Yeah. It is in that void, luckily, that these amazing black women, right, um, stepped stepped up, and they had already been there. They stepped up in a way, and in many ways, they healed communities of color. And they healed communities of color by saying empowerment doesn't just come from outside. Yeah. It comes from inside, really right? And you, this is your identity, and you can hold that identity with pride. So essentially what you're saying is, you know, as we struggle, you know, intersectionality, read the article, please. It's yeah. Kimberly Crenshaw, you know, came her from own. this struggle to have black women really seen and heard in civil rights spaces and in feminist spaces. That's right. And by talking to women of color organizers who have already, you know, done that work and, you know, obviously misogynoir still exists, um, but have been really successful at changing the narrative of how we talk um, about some of these issues. That's right that we should be sort of leaning in and asking those veteran women of color organizers, you know, we're having a moment where we don't feel like our community is being heard and it's frustrating and it's frightening. You, you know, what are some of the ways you help change that narrative? I think that's really fascinating advice. It's, it's fascinating. And I think it's, a, it's important and to remember, right? Intersectionality was created because it identified black women as the most vulnerable in society. And the argument that I think people forget that Kimberly was making was not one of silo, right? Yeah. What she was saying is that if we lift up the most impoverished in our, in our communities, all of us benefit in substantial ways, right? And I think, you know, I, I'd be curious, you know, the question has been is, is, that what most people mean when they say intersectionality today? No. No. Right? Intersectionality means in the most pop culture form, mm -hmm. right, that we are understanding of how different issues work together. And so if you don't understand how anti-Semitism plays a role, yeah. 
then you're not actually acting in an intersectional way right. in, in that pop culture definition. And I think it's also important for us to understand, right, that it's never been an easy to, we act as if we in the social justice world have always been open to new ideas. No, in fact, the reason that we're having these big community brush brush ups, right. that's not a term, is it? These big community we're gonna call it one right brush ups. Now. I like that, brush ups. Right. Uh, these big community conflict moments uh, is because just this work is more inclusive. It is hearing a bigger, broader voice. It is having you know, some of its own hierarchical leadership challenge. I think that's a great point. Yeah. I have another question coming yes. in. Um, I'm curious about Black Lives Matter adopting really strong anti-Zionist stances and really standing with BDS and why that happened and why don't people understand how hard it made it for so many Jews to really be involved, particularly in Black Lives Matter, um, despite our commitment to fighting police brutality. So it's, I, I, I think what the question essentially is saying is, why did that happen and why was there, even now, if you talk to a lot of Black Lives Matter leadership, and I've experienced this personally and very publicly, um, a real, a real lack of understanding of why that was such a deal breaker for the, yeah. for the majority of American yeah. Jews. And not, you know, it's not that that made people stop caring about police brutality, but it That's did it. make people stop taking action. A lot of people, I would venture a majority, feel uncomfortable taking action with Black Lives Matter, which to me is fairly tragic. Yeah. So I think, like, it's important to be, I, I think it is, I think, um, whether one belongs to um, the movement for Black Lives, right, which yeah. Black Lives Matters is one organization uh, within, right, one can, it should not be an excuse not to address police abuse, right? We and, really believe right? that. I think that's, yeah. I think that's right. So you have no excuse to right? work on police brutality with us. So I'm not going to speak for the movement yeah. for Black Lives, right? Um, I can tell you as a long term a uh, social justice activist, a person who has uh, and still is supportive of the movement for black lives, right, works against police brutality. I can kind of explain, I think, my thinking around it. I think it's not, uh, I, I don't know if it's ever an explanation, because I think that explanation is only going to happen through through engagement, mm -hmm. right? So, so my take is, I, I think there's really important pieces to to remember um so again just to put history in context yeah. before ferguson the idea of police abuse was not a big conversation yeah. right yeah. and where it was it was seen as the actions of an individual officer rather than a systemic form of violence on black, Latino, and native communities, right? Mm -hmm. Because we, I think it's also important to acknowledge in the complexity, right, that um, Native Americans are more likely to be killed by law enforcement, right, than any other grouping in America. Oh, that's really right? interesting. I did so, not know that. So I, I like the nuance things, yeah. right? So, so the nuance this further though, so we have Ferguson, Baltimore, New York. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'm leaving out Los Angeles and, and I think two other communities. So apologies. Um, so we have a movement of, of black young folks that hasn't happened in America in a long time. Yeah. And um, what folks think, I don't think know, is that the first, right, so we're social media folks. On social media, the first folks that reach out to these young black activists are Palestinian activists, right? Um, um, in Palestine territories, right? And they are sharing some of their direct action tactics. So there is a relationship. I've read about this. It's very uh, tactical stuff, like how, how to, to deal with tear gas. How to deal with tear yeah. gas, right? How to how to um, 
right, right use toothpaste for tear right to to pull away tooth um uh, tear gap so it's really kind of tactical protest pieces um and as far as i saw at least too i think it's important to say you know and nonviolent, right and so there was an immediate connection there that happened right um and i think that movements often support other movements that have allied with them yeah. right and so I think that is part of the process. I think it is also recognizing, right, the, um, I'm a human rights activist, right? So you can say, right, we can have discussions why and underlying it, but I think it's the concern about the, the treatment of Palestinians, right, in Palestinian territories, right? I know we could have a whole eight hour conversation, right? But those pieces certainly are going to develop sympathy within in the black community. Uh -huh. Where I think the conversation broke down, sadly, was that there wasn't enough commitment for folks to stay in the room with the Jewish community and have that dialogue. And I think part of that had to do, right? And I will say the, that was my experience as someone who really tried to have dialogue. It's hard, yeah. right? Um, and I think it's important. Like, I think that dialogue is important. Um, I think it's hard. I think it's hard if you haven't been in the room together, yeah. because I think one of the things that I, I, I'll point out is um, one of the first persons after the platform was released, someone called me and the first thing they said to me, and this is not disrespect, it just showed the generational gap, yeah. was they said, well, I, I contacted someone in the NAACP and they didn't know who to talk to. Yeah. Right. That showed that there was a generational gap, right, that that existed um, between the movement for black lives and leadership in, in, in the Jewish community. But I also think that in ways that um, folks weren't able to stay in that room together, that it was driven by a false idea in the United States that race is only about skin color, mm -hmm. right? Um, that racism is only about skin color. And it is hard for those of us in the black community, right? I'm including myself, to hold that racism isn't a binary black and white situation, right? So it is hard to understand that people with light skin face forms of discrimination and bias and a system of bigotry known as anti-Semitism that is important for us to understand. And I think that that is still a lot of work that has to happen as well, right? That yeah. um, we have to lean into it. So I, I get that folks made choices. Mm -hmm. Those choices should not lead us away from the issues that we think are important. And that's what that's was right. my sort of lesson from it. I mean, I and look like I've written about police brutality. I've witnessed it, not directly, but, you know, as mm -hmm. a wife of a black man, uh, you know, we have had incidences yeah. with police. Very frightening. Um, and, and one thing I've come back a lot of times, and I, I think is really a guiding value of Zioness, is to say, okay, so this group has been really exclusionary, has failed to stay in conversation with us, and, and has really, you know, I think, I'll say personally, uh, failed in, in coalition building with, with us. Um, but that doesn't mean that we stop fighting police brutality or we stop caring about it. We, we do it in different ways. We do it with different groups. Um, you know, as it says, uh, you can't vote. You don't have to solve the problem, but you're not free to look away. Okay, uh, that's and, right. And and to really see that as you know, holding ourselves to our own values, even when other leadership fails at theirs. And it's hard. Absolutely. And we yeah. have to admit, like, it's hard. There's no guarantees, yeah. right? That that it will work out. But it's worth the engagement, right? Mm -hmm. It it only strengthens society. Um, 
I think to to leave our doors open, right? To yeah. leave that one seat at the table. Um, uh, my mother used to always leave a seat open on on Thanksgiving dinner table. So even if it filled up, she would bring in an extra seat. And I think in in um, in, in that way, we always have to be open. And I think it's important to understand. Right, we are having a debate on anti-Semitism yeah. in America, and um, most of us, I'll include myself, right? Um, someone said you're an expert on anti-Semitism, and I thought to myself, if I'm an expert on anti-Semitism, we're in trouble, right? Mm -hmm. we, yeah. Um, there's so much I don't know, um, but it reflects to me that we have to be somewhat patient because we are having a debate on anti-Semitism. And most folks have not been given the tools to actually have that debate and conversation, right? Yeah. It's going to take some some time, and it's painful to have to wait. I yeah. want to acknowledge that. No, it's definitely painful. Uh, it's painful to have to wait. It's painful, especially in this moment where I think we all feel so... Yes. I mean, no one Urgent. spends their Tuesday night learning about white nationalism That's for right. an hour and 20 minutes if they don't feel That's right. called to action. Um but I, I think it's painful to wait. But I also think for us at INS, we believe that, you know, putting ourselves at those protests, putting ourselves in those rooms, doing that organizing and being honest about who we are and, and what we believe and, and showing up as our true, authentic Jewish selves as, as Zionists and saying, and we're here because our Zionism and our Jewishness, which we feel are intrinsically connected in this space, um, inform and direct us to action, direct us to fight police Absolutely. brutality, direct us. Uh, you know, the Torah is pretty clear on welcoming immigrants and welcoming refugees, you know, to welcome the stranger for we were strangers in Egypt. Um, and, you know, to, you know, the Adam Yahid, that men are all equal. Um, fortunately, it's a little gender normative, but mm -hmm. hey. But we're working um, on that too. We're working on that part too. Uh, and right. that, you know, that we we stay in action places and we we ask for accountability. Uh, we we push people to be accountable. And, and if we if there isn't a place and if they're not able to be accountable, it doesn't free us from the work. That's right. But you know. And and to remember, like, if right, if I didn't work with organizations that um, did things that I just couldn't ever do, right, or would not be willing mm -hmm. to do. And I work with organizations who have invited um, speakers to speak at their event who I would never, right, yeah. I, I, I probably, you know, organize to keep that person out of the country, right? Yeah. Um, hmm. And, uh, but that can't be the measure of whether I work with an organization or not. And, um, you know, again, I think that this is not a left or right debate that is happening yeah. in America. It is a debate around uh, those of us who believe in democracy, right, and those who are seeking a totalitarian society. And um, we have to be willing to work with anyone, right, who believes that democracy is important. And that means sitting in spaces that I would not normally sit in and being in conversation with folks I would not normally be in conversation with. And what I know is that if I start off that conversation by um, uh, telling that person that, you know, I want to talk about, I think you're racist and I want to talk about your racism, right? Or I think you're homophobic or transphobic and I'm, that is the first thing on my agenda. That conversation is not likely to go far, right? Mm -hmm. It is first finding the values that we have in common, right? What are the things that unite us in terms of concern, right? And those other conversations, believe it or not, actually happen, right? Those harder, deeper conversations. But I just tell folks, try to just be in the room with folks you would not normally be in the room with, mm -hmm. right? And that should be anyone who isn't trying to burn down the house. That's interesting. Um, and how do we deal with the pain factor there? It's real pain, right? I can, you, um, you see it. And um, 
I wish I was a person who could say like, you can do this work without feeling any pain or uncomfortability. You are going to feel those things and you need to have, and I think it is why um, third world black feminist, right? Um, in the United States and, uh, and outside the US came up with the caucus strategy, yeah. right? It's an important place to be able to kind of check in and 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 share like the burden, right? Mm -hmm. This is um, um, this is not easy work. This is the work of of building a country. This is the work of building community and 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 building society. And if I could go back, because when will I not ever talk about Lord of the Rings? Yeah. Right. Um, Frodo and the Ring. Yeah. was a burden it wasn't an honor um uh, but that burden those of us who are willing to carry that burden um, we get to live with the knowledge that we do transform lives and yeah. um, we help people find their power and um there is no more beautiful thing um, that uh, a human being can do for another and there we're in total agreement. We are really all about helping you find your power here at Zioness. We'll keep doing uh, conversations like this that are issue training. We'll continue to be doing organizing training throughout the year and years to come. If you're in the Washington, D.C. area, I would love to see you at the Supreme Court with me, uh, you know, marching in defense of DAPA. Uh, and, you know, we'll keep being out there in the street and in these hard spaces having these hard conversations and showing up as authentically who we are fighting for the things we believe in thank you all thank for you spending all. some time with us have a great night thank you carly